Today on the Purpose Based Retirement, we're going to help you plan to protect your surviving spouse and take questions from you. Welcome to the Purpose Based Retirement with Certified Financial Planner Practitioner, Casey Weed. It's not how much we make during the good times, it's how much we keep during those really bad times. Casey leads a team of financial advisors with decades of experience, helping families across the country retire with the confidence they deserve. The Purpose-Based Retirement assigns every dollar you've saved to specific purpose to meet a key retirement need. Whatever risk you've faced, we've got a plan for that. Stay tuned and learn how you can look forward to a worry-free, purpose-based retirement. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Purpose Based Retirement. I'm here with Casey Weed, Certified Financial Planner and the President of Howard Bailey Financial. You know, they say death and taxes are about the only sure things in life, but it's a pretty good bet that one of you in your relationship is going to outlive the other. So we're focusing the start of the program today on taking care of your surviving spouse. Really critical topic. It is, and it's one that's so often overlooked in financial planning. And I can say, you know, we're, we're seeing these phone calls and this happen more and, off, more and more often. It seems like every other week we've got somebody calling in and saying that they've lost a spouse, whether it's a husband or a wife for that matter. Typically, it's, it's wives that are calling in uh, just due to statistics. You know, that's the way it goes. And we've been doing this, you know, long enough that we've got people who have worked with us for the last 20 years. And we're going to see this more and more. And I wanted to have this conversation because most of the planning that's done out there has to do with you and, and your spouse as a family group how do we take care of ensuring you two have enough income that you have minimized your taxes that you have long-term care protection that you have inflation plan and you've got all these things and all these ducks in a row however what's so often overlooked is what happens when we lose one of the two spouses whether it's changes in tax brackets it's losses of income or maybe it's somebody becoming a burden on somebody else due to health care needs so I wanted to have this conversation to make sure that we're really sharing with you what some of the biggest risks are. So if you're at the, the onset of doing your planning or you're already retired and you haven't done that planning, you know what to look out for and you know what you're planning for. Well, in the first step, the five things we're going to touch on today, number one is Social Security because it is really the backbone of retirement for so many people. Yeah, and, and Social Security planning has been a big topic of discussion, it seems, over the last 10 years. Uh, and typically, unfortunately, those conversations are usually about Social Security optimization, maximization as a couple. And the reality is that, and that's a, that's a huge decision. I don't want to undermine that, but at the same time, we have to figure out what's going to happen when we lose one of the two spouses. And I, I had a couple that we recently did this planning for and we were sitting around trying to determine when they were going to file for Social Security and they were planning on filing for the higher of the two Social Securities his Social Security now at 62 they were going to delay her Social Security because it was smaller until it got bigger in the future well the reality is that sooner or later she's most likely going to end up with his benefit so by delaying hers they were ultimately probably not getting anything out of it they were probably losing income along the yeah. way because they were delaying hers and ultimately she was going to end up with the larger of the two. If we're not delaying the larger of the two benefits, we're ultimately shortchanging the spouse with the smaller benefit. And it may not be a big deal if we've got large disparities in our Social Security. Maybe it's $20,000 for one spouse, $10,000 for the other. Well, we're going to end up with the larger of the two. So we did have $30,000 income. Now we have twenty. dollars But what if we have two spouses that maybe worked at the same place? They had similar levels of income and earnings history. Now maybe they both have benefits that are $20,000 a year. So they have a total benefit of $40,000. If one of the two spouses passes away, they get a 50% cut in their income. Again, this may not seem like a big deal, but do the math before you make these decisions because even $1,000 a month, you go, oh, it's only $1,000 a month. But if you wanted to recreate $1,000 a month in income from a pile of investments or cash that you have, you might have to have upwards of $300,000 in order to recreate that income. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a $300,000 decision on a thousand dollars a month a six hundred thousand dollar decision on two thousand a month don't take that for granted sit down and work with a financial planner on social security optimization and maximization but also social security planning for your spouse's future in case one of the two of you passes away so next to social security a pension
prevention is probably the most significant element in many families these days. What do I need to think about yeah. there? Well, we're still working with a lot of families that are making big pension decisions, fewer and fewer it seems every year, but these are just as big of a decision as you're making with your Social Security and maybe even bigger because we have more options to work with when it comes to making that decision. Are we going to take the 100% joint survivor benefit? Are we going to take the 50% benefit? Or are we going to take the single life benefit? And sometimes we just say, well, let's just take the largest of the numbers. And we need to do more planning than that. Marshall Johnson, our vice president, recently did a, a plan for a gentleman and his spouse that had a large disparity in age. Then, let's say it was $3,000 a month as a single life pension benefit, $1,500 as a joint survivor benefit. Well, what we decided to do was rather than just take that single life or joint life benefit, because you want to make sure a spouse is taken care of. of course. What we decided to do was let's look at other options rather than buying insurance through the pension company, which is what we're doing with it's costing $1,500 a month to make sure the spouse gets income. And it's going to cost $1,500 a month for the rest of their life. When there's a declining need for a lump sum, mm -hmm. we pay the same premium essentially every year. What we should be doing and what we structured for them were several different life insurance policies, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 25 years, where we laddered these policies so that their premium went down year over year. So as their premium goes down, they're putting more income back in their pockets. Right. So they're actually going to net about $1,000 a month on average, extra income in their pocket over their lifetime, and they have the peace of mind to know that they have flexibility to cancel those policies if they want, and they also have the ability to know that they always are going to leave something behind to the next generation. People's number one concern about annuities is that the insurance company keeps all the money, pension company keeps all the money. Right. This insulates that and makes sure that something's passing on to your heirs. And we can often use a portion or all of that death benefit for long-term care needs while we're still living. The pension company is not going to give you an advance because you have a long-term care need. Exactly. Tax planning becomes more significant as you move through that single spouse situation. What, what yeah. do I need to know? Well, we talk about tax planning as couples, right? Maybe we're doing Roth conversions or we're uh, tax sheltering non-qualified funds to minimize ongoing taxation. But what happens when you lose one of the two spouses? They go from married filing jointly to becoming a single filer. And that means that now you're going to end up paying more in taxes. Let's take, for instance, somebody that had a $70,000 annual income. If you had a $70,000 annual income as a couple today, under TCJA rules, you're in the 12% bracket. If you lose $20,000 in income, maybe you lost a Social Security due to one of the two spouses passing away, you now have $50,000 in income. But that put the surviving spouse not in the 12% bracket, they jumped up to the 22% bracket, saw over an 80% increase in their tax bracket that they're actually going to be in, the effective tax rate they're going to pay in that next level from 12 to 22 and they have less income. We need to make sure that we're doing some planning, which we're going to talk about here at the end of the show, about how we can convert some of that income to tax-free income and make a bigger impact on that surviving spouse. I want to do get to long-term care that's so critical for so many yeah. people. Uh, why do I need to be thinking about that ahead of time? Sure, we, we know that you know, if we have a long-term care need, that might be five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month or more. I think the, the male is more concerned about his wife mm -hmm. than he is about himself. He'll say, well, I don't need long-term care coverage. I want her to have it. Right. Well, I recently had a situation where he, he had said that. Years ago, he said, I do not want any long-term care coverage, but I want it for her. Well, she got it. However, he didn't. And then he ended up needing care. And she tried to take care of him as long as she could, but she just couldn't handle it anymore. And it was having an effect on her standard of living. He was becoming a burden. She still loved him. She wanted to take care of him, but it would have been a lot better if she would have had some type of plan in place to take care of his long-term care needs to reduce expenses, reduce burden, give her a little bit more freedom, and put him ultimately in a better place where he could have better care. We talk about knowing where the money is and, and what to do with it in case something happens, tax plan, all these things need to be educated and communicated with your spouse. But just here today, I had a phone call uh, from a client that we've been working with for about 20 years. And she said the biggest issue that she's had to confront 
front, the most troubling thing that she's had is one, she lost a social security benefit, but she also has to live on a budget. And she'd never lived on a budget. In reality, they've been retired for almost two decades. They've been living on a budget for that long, but he handled all of the finances. He understood the budget. He understood the inflow and the outflow and never brought her into that fold. And if we can get both spouses on the same page to this is what the income is going to look like while we're living, while I've passed away, this is how much taxes we're going to pay, and have everything wrapped up in a nice neat package, then that spouse, while they're living, they have the confidence to know I'm okay if something happens to my spouse. And it goes both ways. Peace of mind to, to the survivors, peace of mind to, to the one that's still living, to know that we've taken those necessary steps to make sure that our spouse is going to be okay. We've communicated and now we can all rest easier on our way through retirement and once we lose a spouse. So I hope that peace of mind thought sticks with you and that you'll carry forward by going to the purposebasedretirement.com. There you can order a copy of one of Casey's books. You can sign up for uh, some events that they have coming up yet this month. And you can also request an appointment. So just visit them at thepurposebasedretirement.com. All right, we're back in just a second. We have questions from viewers we'll be answering, so you stay with us. You need a plan to create the retirement you deserve. The first step is to tune in to the Purpose Based Retirement Radio Hour with Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. Saturdays at 11 a.m. and Sundays at 1 p.m. on WoWo 107.5 FM or Sunday mornings at 11 on 95.3 MNC. The highest educational achievement for a financial planner is the Certified Financial Planner Certification. At Howard Bailey, all of our frontline advisors are CFP practitioners. Certified financial planners have been thoroughly vetted with the right education and experience to coach you through the complexities of your retirement. Getting to retirement, that's really the easy part. Find someone with what it takes to get you through this next stage of your life. Would your financial and retirement affairs benefit from a higher level of insight and care? Call us now to find out. So this is uh, Casey's favorite part of the program where we're answering questions from you guys, uh, people who have emailed at info at howardbailey.com. We select some of these questions and then ask you to join us on the phone, and that's what we've done. Our first caller today is Curtis from Mishawaka. Hello, this is Curtis out of Mishawaka. What is reverse churning, and how do I avoid it? Thanks for your question, Curtis. A lot of people know what churning is, right? And now we're starting to hear more about reverse churning as more fee-based structures have come onto the marketplace when it comes to advisory solutions. And uh, churning was always, well, your, your broker picks up the phone, gives you a call and says, hey, I think we should sell this stock and buy this stock or sell this mutual fund and buy that mutual fund. It's typically over trading within an account. I've also seen churning. I had uh, a, a, a couple that came down and uh, were looking for a local advisor after working with an advisor out of Toledo. They came into Fort Wayne and were looking for a new advisory group here locally. And uh, one of the things that they had done is their advisor had put them into A-share mutual funds. They had paid a load up front, a commission to the advisor. And then every couple of years, he would move funds from those mutual funds into fixed annuities and variable annuities in order to generate another commission, saying, well, we need protection over time. And uh, reverse churning is something that has really come to the forefront here recently. Uh, the largest brokerage house in the country is being sued for reverse churning right now. And what that is typically, uh, what that typically means is uh, someone that's putting you into a fee-based account where you're paying one, two percent a year, but they're not actively trading on that account or providing value in the management itself. They throw it into one or two ETFs or one or two mutual funds and they don't make any changes periodically or there isn't any ongoing management. There's no tax planning, income planning, estate planning being provided that's providing comprehensive value. So, But the reason that a lot of these larger brokerage firms are being sued right now is because they made this transition due to what the DOL pushed for, which was a university, universal fiduciary rule for everyone in the industry that offered financial advice. So anybody that offered financial advice was now going to be required to act in uh, your best interest. However, it didn't go through, and so we don't have a fiduciary uniform standard standard for all uh, financial advice providers out there. We still have brokers that fall under the suitability standard, and
and then investment advisors and registered investment advisors that fall under a fiduciary standard. What is going on is a lot of these large brokerage houses and wire houses like this one were taking people out of mutual funds where they paid upfront loads and now they were shifting them. They saw this fiduciary push as an opportunity to generate more revenues and fees to the detriment of their clients, mm -hmm. moving them out of mutual funds that had performed quite well, that had low fees and expenses because they had paid those things up front into these models, these portfolio models that they were charging one to two percent a year in order to manage those funds on an ongoing basis. And not only were they being reinvested where they were generating additional fees, but they were still participating in revenue sharing and providing proprietary products within that model where they were generating additional revenue for the firm by moving funds from one place to the next. And the way that you can look out for these types of things, I think, is simply to work with a true fiduciary. Don't work with someone that just says, hey, I'm a fiduciary for you, when in reality they're a broker. Go out and find somebody that's a registered investment advisor that falls under the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. That means that they've been a fiduciary for a number of years, and they carry a Series 65 securities license rather than a Series 7 or Series 66. And you can look your advisor up on Broker Check and see where they fall under, uh, whether that's falling under FINRA or the SEC, that will help you determine whether they're suitability standard or fiduciary standard. Find yourself a fiduciary, may maybe interview one or two of them and find somebody that you're really comfortable with that can get you away from these types of things. All right. Uh, let's jump over to Huntington and Terry. Hi, this is Terry from Huntington. And I was wondering, what's your opinion on giving money to your kids before you die? Well, Terry, I know a lot of families we work with, they want to do this. They say, I want to give funds to my kids while I can still see them enjoy it. I want to give funds to my children at the time that they need it, not when I'm gone. And you know, I, I think there's something that it's OK about. Maybe you want to help them out with uh, buying a new car, help them with a down payment on a house. What I don't want you to do is I don't want you to take that gift of struggle away from them, that character building that resulted in, in what you have today. You've created a substantial substantial amount of money potentially. You've saved a lot. And you have a lot of respect for that life savings. You care about it because you knew the struggle that it took to get that life savings. You have to respect for that money because of the struggle. Don't take that struggle away from your children by just giving them funds where now they don't have to work or they don't have to work as hard or now they know that they can always call mom and dad in case they have an emergency so they don't build an emergency fund. They always have something to fall back on. I think it's important to let those children struggle in order to make sure that they can build that character and respect for the life savings in the first place. I think there's also some other issues that are side issues, whether those are tax issues that you need to pay attention to or just w where those dollars are coming from. Um, for instance, a lot of folks will say, well, I, I want to sell the farm because I, I had a couple the other day that wanted to sell their farm and they wanted to gift the money to the kids so that when they passed away, they didn't fight over it, they didn't have to liquidate it. I said, well, why don't you first sit down and have this discussion with your kids and see what they want to do rather than making this decision without having that conversation, especially with farmland. If you have a farm today that's worth, say, $800,000, we know farmland's gone gangbusters over the last 10 to 20 years. You may have only paid $200,000 or you have a $200,000 cost basis in that farm. You have $600,000 in appreciation. It's taxed at long-term capital gains rates. So you pay upwards of $120,000 or more in taxes. Now, if you would have waited till you passed away, the children would have got a step up in basis. They could have sold it without paying any taxes. It would have saved them $120,000. You might want to have that conversation with them, and they might say, you know, I do want the money right now, but I don't need it, and I would prefer to get an extra $100,000 when you pass away by just leaving this alone, and we'll take care of it when you pass away. This could be individual stocks. This could be mutual funds. It could be more traditional investments. It doesn't have to be real estate or farmland. But a lot of times you can get a lot out of having that conversation as a family. I know, you know another thing that you might want to think about is if you want to leave a, a substantial amount of funds aside, rather than giving them, say, $100,000 to pay off their mortgage, they're going to make 3%, maybe 4% in this interest rate environment on that $100,000. If you set up a trust for them, you might be able to provide a 5 10 15% fixed rate of return uh, tax-free that they wouldn't be able to get on their own. So you can generate a 
higher return to ultimately grow more funds and provide more security to them if you handle those funds yourself rather than helping them pay off a low interest mortgage. So just a lot of things to think about, I think, before we just start throwing money at our kids. Uh, Napanee is where we're headed next, and Renee. What's the difference between a good annuity and a bad annuity? Well, Renee, I think the difference between a good annuity and a bad annuity, from my experience, is largely education and understanding what you have. We have so many people that come in their office that own fixed annuities, index annuities, variable annuities that just simply don't understand what they have, and that ends up being something that they don't like because it was put there for the wrong purpose. It was put there for their advisor's benefit, not their own benefit. You have a fixed annuity with that you didn't understand the surrender charges on. You didn't understand the free withdrawal percentages that you could have out of that account. Now you need need excess income and it's going to cost you a penalty to get those funds out. You have an indexed annuity that you thought you got all the upside of the market and none of the downside, but you really only get 50% participation in the market. You might have a variable annuity that has an income rider on it. It's, oh, I thought I had a 7% guarantee on my money. Well, the reality is you had to take that out as an income for the rest of your life. And you go, well, I don't need any income. I was hoping just to leave that behind for my kids. Well, had you understood that it was for income and you needed income, Income, it might have been the greatest thing you could have added to your portfolio, but now that you don't need the income, now you've got something that is probably the worst thing that you could have possibly put your dollars into. So spending some under, some time to understand what you have can provide you with something, any financial vehicle, whether it's mutual funds or stocks or bonds or annuities or life insurance, whatever it is, if we make a move without understanding it, that can be really detrimental to your life savings. Can I turn to you for help, even though I might not have received yeah. that annuity through you? Well, and I think it's important that you, know, you get a second opinion from somebody other than the person you got your first opinion from. And so I think it does make sense to go down and sit down with another financial advisor. But don't just let that advisor or us tell you what you have. Let's pick up the phone, call an independent third party, which would be the company that actually issued it. So is it Lincoln? Is it Athene? Is it mm -hmm. Allianz? Yeah, let's pick whatever company that is, and let's walk you through a questionnaire that helps you understand the fees and expenses, what the benefits mean, what the roll-ups are, how much market participation you get, how you get money out of that vehicle, what the penalties are, when they're going to go away, if you have any annuitization options. There's a lot of questions to ask because these can be very complex vehicles. And some people don't want to go in and sit down with an advisor and have them walk them through that process because maybe it's uncomfortable. Well, we'll send you out a questionnaire. You can have the questionnaire and you can go ask those questions. Don't ask the questions to the person that sold it to you. You make that phone call to the provider and they can give you those black and white answers so you can really understand what you have. All right. And the first step to that is visiting the PurposeBasedRetirement.com, PurposeBasedRetirement.com. You can request a, a meeting there, an appointment. Uh, get a copy of one of Casey's books or sign up to be a, a guest at one of their upcoming events. All right. We're back in just a second after our question of the day. And we're going to put you to the test with this one. What percentage of women outlive their spouse? Casey has the answer when we come back. You need a plan to create the retirement you deserve. The first step is to tune in to the Purpose Based Retirement Radio Hour with Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. Saturdays at 11 a.m. and Sundays at 1 p.m. on WoWo 107.5 FM or Sunday mornings at 11 on 95.3 MNC. The highest educational achievement for a financial planner is the Certified Financial Planner Certification. At Howard Bailey, all of our frontline advisors are CFP practitioners. Certified financial planners have been thoroughly vetted with the right education and experience to coach you through the complexities of your retirement. Getting to retirement, that's really the easy part. Find someone with what it takes to get you through this next stage of your life. Would your financial and retirement affairs benefit from a higher level of insight and care? Call us now to find out. Heading into the break, we asked you our question of the day, and it was, what percentage of women outlive their spouse? We know that women are going to live longer, Casey, but how many of them? Well, I darn sure know my wife's going to outlive me, and the answer is 80% of women are going to, on average, outlive their male counterparts, and that comes from the U.S. Census Bureau. And I wonder how long, on average, they actually live uh, beyond what the male counterpart does. And on average, it's 14 years. That's 14 additional years that most likely 80% of women 
women are going to be left as single individuals living on their income that they've been left with. And what we want to talk about, as we often talk about on the show, is managing the risks to your income strategy during retirement, whether that's market risk or inflation risk or long-term care risk. However, we also need to have the discussion in regards to what your spousal income risks are as well. So we're going to walk you through an example here. Bob and Sally, we have Bob with $23,000 in Social Security income, $20,000 in pension income, generating $45,000 a year in retirement for the household. Sally has a smaller Social Security at $14,000 a year. So altogether, they currently have around $60,000 a year in annual income. But what if something happens to Sally. Well, if Sally passes away, they're going to lose the smaller of the two Social Security benefits, and she didn't have a pension benefit, so they end up just losing $14,000 in annual income that continues to Bob. So now he gets $44,000 a year. That's a reduction of about 24%, which may seem significant, but what happens if Bob passes away? Now, if Bob passes away first, we're going to see that they lose the smaller of the two Social Security benefits benefits, but we also have a reduction in pension income that's going to continue on to Sally. That means her total annual income goes down to $34,000 from about $60,000, over $2,000 a month. She's going to lose an in income. That's a 42% reduction. She got her income almost cut in half. Another thing that you need to recognize, if you go from married filing jointly to a single filer, what happens to your tax bracket? Well, we can see if we had, say, $70,000 in income, we would now be at 22% bracket instead of the 12% bracket. So we could see potentially an 83% increase in the amount of taxes the single filer is now going to see moving into the future. So what can you do about it? Well, one, you can start, start to look into tax-free income strategies. You might start thinking about tax-free income strategies for you and your spouse. However, you also want to make sure that you have tax-free income for the surviving spouse, most importantly. That might help mitigate that increase in taxes that that surviving spouse might have. This could be done through Roth conversions or a myriad of other strategies. Another thing to look into is life insurance. And that may seem odd. You go, well, why would I need life insurance? insurance while I'm in retirement with no mortgage. Well, essentially, if we lose a portion of that income, we want to recreate that income with potentially a lump sum of tax-free death benefits, and that might be accomplished through life insurance. It might also be accomplished through income insurance. You insure your car, you insure your home, why not go ahead and insure your income for that surviving spouse? I had a couple that came in and joined our office here about a year and a half ago, and when they came in, one of the two of them had cancer. He had cancer and he was concerned that he may not live much longer. And he wanted to ensure that income would be guaranteed for the rest of his spouse's life in case something happened to him. We established a guaranteed income strategy that will kick in if he passes away, providing her with a paycheck that will hit her bank account every month for as long as she lives, no matter how long that is. And we also introduced some tax strategies that will reduce the tax burden and ensure that she maintains the same tax bracket once he passes away. These are discussions that you need to be having with your financial planner, with your attorney, with your CPA, preferably as a team, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And above all else, look towards communication with your spouse and make sure that everyone is on the same page and understands the direction that they're going to be headed in, not just now, but if we have a loss of one of the two spouses. Man, that's pretty eye-opening, an 83% increase in taxes when your income has cut 40%. You do yeah. need to be having these conversations. Absolutely, and these are the types of conversations we have every day in our office with the people that are coming in to visit with us. As I said earlier in the show, we've been doing this for about 20 years now, and we've got more and more people coming in that are losing spouses. We're very familiar with this type of planning, both post 
death and mm -hmm. also prior to that. So make sure you're sitting down, having these conversations, and insulating your spouse against these risks, making life easier for them. Well, let's make life easier for you as well. You can go to the PurposeBasedRetirement.com. You can request an appointment with Casey or a member of the team. You can order a copy of Casey's book or find out how you can attend an upcoming event and learn more about just exactly this type of a situation because we really do care and want to make sure that you have the kind of retirement you need. All right, we'll see you next week. You take good care of yourselves.